Hi. Uh, thank you for joining and welcome. I'm Zara and I'm going to be talking to you today about the climate risk tool that we worked on uh, at Van Oort. And uh, Van Oort is the company where I work. They are mostly working offshore, uh, coastal projects, uh, civil engineering projects uh, with uh, construction contractors. So, um, yeah, here we go. I will not be just presenting my own work, but we work together with uh, the data lab team. Um, and uh, we are a combination of GIS and data engineers uh, in the team. So it was a truly collaborative effort. Uh, and just uh, to begin, uh, how did it all start? Uh, we had a question uh, from our sustainability team. Uh, they wanted a tool where uh, business developers could uh, use uh, to uh, start like the early planning phase of uh, where they could uh, plan a project, uh, specifically climate adaptation projects. And this question had to be, of course, based on geospatial data. So uh, we had a, some of the answers that we wanted uh, were quite general. Uh, started with knowing where is the most flood risk, where are most people affected, and uh, what kind of uh, natural resources lie in those regions, and uh, other really uh, social and economic indicators as well, but that came later. And as the idea got uh, more developed, uh, we just uh, said, let's start with the coastline because uh, Van Oort mostly works along the coast. And uh, this would give a very good starting point. And uh, somebody's idea was just break up the coastline into 10 by 10 polygons because that's enough area for a project to start, but not so big as it covers a whole city. Uh, and of course, we wanted to use different factors to calculate over those polygons uh, different statistics uh, and get our answers. And we just dove in. We didn't do a lot of research in the start. We just uh, dove in. We were anxious to just start. And we thought we'll just improve the method on the way. And uh, not going into too much detail about each data set, but just a quick look at what uh, we used. Um, these are just some of the processing data sets we used globally. Uh, and uh, the parts where I will really uh, zoom into is just the interesting part of the project is uh, where we try to create a base layer that's good enough to do further calculations on fit for our purpose. And before I uh, start, I also wanted to say that uh, this tool was not like a new idea. We uh, there are other tools, of course, that, uh, that show climate risk areas, but we also wanted to be able to insert our own questions into the tool, like add our own data and customize it a little bit for the company. So that's why we decided to create our own. Okay, <laughs> so uh, then uh, we were dreaming of polygons, literally, um, because for a few weeks, we were just discussing, okay, how can we break up the whole coastline uh, with polygons, uh, think about projections and how to get uh, everything in one go in one script. But that was not so simple. We used a combination of QGIS scripts, FME scripts. Uh, later on for processing, we used also Google Earth Engine, but that's uh, not part of uh, this slide. Um, so the first iteration, we just uh, took the coastline, the coastline data set from NOAA, and uh, buffered uh, equidistant, equidistant points of 10 kilometers along the coast and just uh, came up with these uh, funny circles around the coast, dissolved it, uh, got a very chunky buffer <laughs> along the coast, and uh, this was used to further divide the areas into approximately 10 by 10. So a snapshot of the result looks 
uh, like this in some areas. So it was a whole global coastline uh, data set result, but this is just zoomed in. And just to show you that, yes, it was very crude, uh, the results. So first along uh, the, I don't know how to, I think, uh, yeah, here you go. So here it's a bit smoother, but you see along the curved uh, more vertices, it's kind of messy. So of course, uh, this could be improved and we moved on to the next uh, methods to try. And then we came up with this uh, turtle data set. That was a joke, but uh, because the result looked a bit like uh, turtle backs. Uh, the <laughs> so we, we decided to increase our area of interest because uh, we also found out in our processing result that the first iteration did not give enough people exposed to flooding risk as, as mentioned in the literature. And we thought, okay, we're not covering all at-risk areas, so we decided to increase the buf uh, buffer or the area of interest to plus 10 and then minus 50 meters into the sea. And th those boundaries were decided because that's how far you can go to do offshore work in the sea. And of course, this was uh, a lot, a mix of FME and QGS work. So. Uh, just use the GEPCO data set to get the contours of plus 10 and minus 50, and then filled it up with points, uh, clustered the points, and then uh, generated Voronoi polygons, my colleague Lisette's uh, idea. So um, she waited a long time before the FME script completed and got these polygons out. but. It took a long time because we forgot to smooth the GEPCO outline uh, and the contour lines, and it was just very detailed along the edges. Um, and of course, yeah, we generated center points for each polygon because we wanted that for further calculations. Um, and we also wanted uh, separate land and sea areas, so we cut uh, cut up those areas by the coastline again. And this was just the base layer attribute set that we got. Uh, again, more examples uh, around the world. Uh, and you see it's a little bit more uniform than the previous uh, result, but still along the edges, it's not, it's not very comparable to, let's say, a proper turtleback polygon. <laughs> So, um, also after processing all our data sets with population, uh, yeah, uh, elevation, uh, storm sets, we found out that yes, we are missing um, some things like um, the small island states were not represented really well in the method that we tried because some of the data did not align very well uh, this is just one example from Tuvalu, a small uh, island in the South Pacific, and uh, the contour just missed the population data set by being a little bit uh, away. And we only captured one person in there, so that, that did not look uh, right uh, in our result. And of course, we were a bit constrained because certain data was not available above a certain latitude. And we still had so many scripts we were patching together, so uh, we didn't have a very easy way to rerun our scripts without calling each other up. So uh, then uh, we thought, okay, we need a better way to automate our script and make, make something more uniform. And then we thought, uh, why not use Uber H3 hexagons and you might be thinking, yeah, why didn't you think of this in the first place? <laughs> but uh, we didn't. Uh, we were too focused on the f coastline in the start. And uh, we just now decided to completely forget about the coastline data set and use uh, the exclusive economic zones data set to define our land and sea areas because uh, this data set actually extends out into the sea uh, for the areas that you are allowed to explore and work 
uh, in, the, in the offshore region. So using that was uh, making sense. It also included all the country information, so we didn't have to add that ourselves. Um, and then why use Uber 3, H3 hexagons were because uh, it made things very easy for us to automate. It already had a Python API and we didn't need to patch scripts together. And uh, we also compared it with some other uh, geo encoding systems and it turned out this was, this was actually suiting the purpose really well. And this is uh, parts of the code that I uh, got here. It was very simple to just take the exclusive economic zone data set uh, specify the uh, unit we wanted and specify the area we wanted, uh, resolution uh, we wanted, and say, hey, create hexagons out of all these areas with the boundaries uh, that, uh, that are defined. And it worked. It did take a long time, but it, it worked for the whole global uh, set. And then in the end, our result was uh, level five, uh, hexagons and the sides were approximately 10 kilometers which is roughly what we wanted and you see like a sample of the result it looks more uniform and more comparable with the other compared to the other previous previous uh, base data set that we found so this is a snapshot from uh, the previous iteration and the h3 hexagons results just showing the center points of uh, the polygon sets because we didn't want to load all the polygons. We just wanted to uh, load the points uh, in the web app. And it, it looked much better. And we solved some of the problems that I mentioned before with this uh, result. So now I move on to the next part of the presentation. I have time, I think. So. Uh, the next thing after we got this uh, bit sorted out, we wanted to have uh, a place where the results are easy to visualize for end users. And these were not necessarily uh, GIS users. These were business uh, stakeholders, uh, partners, and uh, people who uh, don't know necessarily too much about GIS, but they want, they want to see a nice picture uh, with data. So, um, so we thought, yes, a very easy way for users to visualize the results and filter them quickly would make sense in a single page application. And uh, we were excited to do that because after all that processing, it was nice to just work on a front end application. Uh, so the challenge there was to just make the filters very fast, otherwise uh, it did not look, it did not feel very good using the app. Uh, so the results data set that we had over 60,000 points, not so much after the previous presentation, but uh, this was uh, just loading in open layers. Uh, we just decided to go with uh, open layers and vector source, and of course, uh, it was not very fast in the start. So we decided to first break it up, break up the initial file into parts and then load it in parts. Uh, and this is because we, did, we didn't have time to make a back end at that point. So we just said everything should be in, a, in the front end. Uh, the second round we thought, okay, loading uh, and filtering should be good and we we should also be good with a tiny back end very simple uh, just one table and just one or two apis to serve the data and just be done with it this is how it worked in our <laughs> company so yeah we have to do it fast and uh, uh, my colleague Gurkham couldn't be here he uh, discovered the postgres back end and he implemented the uh, API to serve the data with just one small script uh, which populates the data from a storage and just creates the views as soon as you start up uh, de deploying the application. So 
he also worked on the open layers, uh, uh, WebGL points layers. Uh, he added that with uh, DC cross filter. So uh, to make the filtering really smooth because the WebGL uh, filter library was not really doing what we wanted it to do. So, uh, and here you have the app. Actually, you can see it online. It's um, available to check out. Uh, and this is a bit of an introduction of it. Uh, you see some of the, our results on the side. So uh, these are actually, these are actually attributes, uh, not different layers. So it's just one big layer with different, a lot of different attributes and we decided to show some of them. Um, just some more examples from different results. And of course, you can view more information about each point. Filter applied uh, in this slide, so play with it and uh, see uh, how smooth it is. Uh, that's what we wanted. So, of course, we don't have everything here. It's, it's just an overview. Uh, serves the purpose of starting a conversation. Uh, we still don't know what really is the local context in each part of the world. And it's still unknown and important. And, of course, important to investigate once, uh, once the location is uh, is decided on. So that's missing, of course. And it's not super uh, clear how every data set is updated. So uh, we still need to work on being able to update the data more frequently. And of course, there are factors we haven't thought of um, that contribute to climate vulnerability. There's some further reading. Uh, not exhaustive, of course, and uh, that's about it. I uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much and uh, really good work. Now, um, any questions? We have still some five minutes. Maybe I can ask one for um, what, what would be your next steps here or uh, what was still not done with this um, project? Uh, well, uh, we hope that they use the tool to actually contact partners and get together and make a business plan for action because that was the purpose of the tool. And that's going on, so uh, the sustainability team is talking to different people to use the tool, but I would, uh, I would want that it's easy to update the data now because, uh, for example, the mangroves data set is from a certain year, and if I want to update that, it will take me quite some uh, script time to, to rerun it and then redeploy the application. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's one, one really important thing. Okay, the d data management uh, challenges. Um, uh, I, uh, actually, one question when I looked, uh, you decided to build your own front end here, but there are some cloud-based uh, open source tools, QJS Cloud and, and others, which kind of try to do the same thing. Did you consider or try to use any, any such platform? Uh, for the front end? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, they had very specific uh, requirements to view the, the results. So mm -hmm. uh, because of those specific requirements by, by the business team, uh, we had to make it exactly like they wanted. So yeah, that's, that's always a, the, a the, the design, of course, was important. Yeah, yeah, that's always, um, yeah. yeah, that's my uh, own everyday work also, either do solution better or adjust the requirements. That's sometimes the easier. Yeah. <laughs> Client is always right. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. So my question is about uh, data processing. You mentioned you use two tools, FME and QGIS. So what exactly you couldn't do with FME that you could do with QGIS and vice versa? 
Good question. So, uh, uh, one of my colleagues was really an FME expert and uh, not so used to using QGIS. So, she found it easier to use uh, breaking up the coastline uh, in a certain way with FME and then generating the Voronoi polygons, we used QGIS because they had a nice tool for that and there was a mix. It was just personal preference. It wasn't, uh, wasn't deliberate, uh, forced. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's always a good uh, w solution actually to use tools which you can use and not to overthink that maybe something else is a little bit better or worse for that. If it works, just go crazy, use it. Uh, FMA is not exactly open source, I think, but... Um, no. <laughs> uh, 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 it, it has a good all inside, I guess. Google's in there, Google's in there, there's a lot of... There's, yeah. there's a lot of, uh, yeah, tools, but... It, we, we use a mix, so both mm -hmm. QGIS, FME, Python. Mm -hmm. uh. Yeah, yeah. Um, awesome tools around. Any other questions? Or we can have a, a small uh, exchange of room. Now we will have a session of um, uh, lightning talks, so five minute uh, pitches, super intensive, super uh, contentful, and um, uh, thank you, and let's give applause here. Thank you.